Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scene tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your hosts, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Welcome to Inside the Firm. I am your co-host, Lance Psycho, and I am not joined by my co-host, Alex Gore, because today's episode is a special one. It is a crossover episode that we recorded about a week ago with the guys over at the Arcuspeak podcast. So big thanks to Evan Troxel and Cormac for having us on their show. Uh, it was a, it was a great interview. They asked us some some great questions, and we don't usually get put in a position like that uh, because obviously Alex and I, you know, are not going to ask our ourselves questions. So. Um, Really appreciate them having us on. Hope you guys enjoy it. I'm actually down in Florida right now fishing uh, for some for some big fishes from the sea. And uh, so wish me luck. Uh, but before we get into the show, let's uh, take a little minute here to thank our sponsors. So first one is, if you're still on the fence about going down to trade shows in person this year, how are you going to keep up with the latest and greatest in architectural products? Well, we're here to introduce... The Art Cat Alert. Get in the scoop this week. Get in the scoop in this weekly newsletter featuring leading manufacturers and their newest and best products. And since it's backed by Art Cat, you know you can begin researching these products for free and without registration. There's also Archaea Tech. It is a curated newsletter. That's the most interesting art architecture stories of the week check them out at artcat.com forward slash a r c a t e c t that's a r c a t dot com forward slash a r c a t e c t and don't forget arcat has all of the all the cad bim and specifications that you need with over 150 manufacturers with accredited uh, courses also for your continuing education credits. So go over to arccat.com forward slash CES and start getting those credits today. This episode is also brought to you by uh, Revit Rocket Ship. If you are still using CAD, if you are still drafting by hand, and if you are nervous about making the leap to Revit, I'm telling you, Al Gore has the solution for you. That's right. The co-host who is not here has the solution for you. Go over to RevitRocketShip.com, enroll on the course. You get our template that we've honed in on for almost a decade now, and it's going to help you become a better architect. It's going to be help you become a better professional. It's going to help you become more profitable. So check that out. Uh, last thing is go to architect to builder dot teachable dot com uh you can also go to uh architect let me see here architects guide to dot com it'll bring you there architects plural guide to to dot com and use the promo code itf and we are going to take you on a journey we're going to demystify the process for you about how you can change you can morph you can expand you can help yourself and you can go from architect to builder Trust me, even if you're just building your own house, if you're an architect, you're listening to this <clears throat> and you have the dream of building your own house or doing an addition, stop paying a general contractor 10 to 24, 20% on all of the stuff that you, you can do. You can do it. So it'll instantly pay off even if you're just doing your own house. And we actually recommend maybe you should even do your own house first because that's how I was able to find a lot of the subs that we like to use. Um, it help, uh, helps also help me uh, just understand um, may fully the process, right, from front to back, kind of demystify it. Same thing with our development, doing your own projects first. But how do you get there? How do you do it? How do you get licensed? How do you find the insurance? What is what is the process? You need a, you, How do you put together bids? All of that. We go over all of it in the course. So check it out. So go to one last time here, okay? Go to architectsguide2.com and use the promo code ITF to get 10% off and uh, enjoy. So with that, here's the show. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Evan Troxel. 
I'm Cormac Bailey. And on this episode, we have two very special guests. I went to visit these guys when I was on a road trip to Colorado a couple of years ago and was live on their show. And that is called Inside the Firm. And Lance, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm My name is Lance Psycho, and I'm one of the co-hosts and co-founders of F9 Productions, co-hosts of Inside the Firm podcast. And I am Alex Gore, and I am not a cat. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> no, man. No, man. And also the co-host of Everything Lance said. Here you go. And and so these guys have a like they said a podcast called Inside the Firm. They're partners at F9 Productions and which is an architectural firm and you guys are in Longmont, Colorado. And yep. you've been through a very interesting process over the past few years and you've been going through that on your show for the last, I don't know, 2 or 3 years. Yep. Why don't you explain uh, kind of what you've been what, what you've been up to? Four years, <clears throat> believe it or not. Wow. So I just wow. yeah, I looked at our uh, I looked at when we our first episode, our first episode of Inside the Firm was in 2017, right at the end of it, and it coincided exactly with when we purchased our first piece of raw land to take the leap, um, following like the lead of Jonathan Segal out in California, out in San Diego, of trying to become architect, builder, developer. And doing that whole thing. Yeah. And the podcast <clears throat> started to basically just document that sequence. Um, and there was actually two reasons and then expanded. So document that sequence so everyone could follow along and see what we're doing. Uh, it turned out the permit process took forever. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> took twice as long as the actual build process. Um, but you, you'll see us throughout that whole process tell what's going on. There were some really, really tough times. One of the units flooded. I mean, it was crazy stressful at, at, at times. That episode is actually called Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls. Uh, <laughs> nice. Seriously. And it's a ripoff of uh, the TLC song, Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls. Yeah. 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 You, guys, you guys are old enough to remember that. Hey. Uh, that's not cool. <laughs> it's true. Not cool, but true. <laughs> and then the other thing was – you know, we're busy and we did it uh, a lot. Of, sometimes we were so busy we couldn't talk uh, just because we were out in different job sites doing different things. So we thought, well, at least we'll have this hour each Friday that we can talk about stuff inside the firm. And why not? Our philosophy has always just been to give where we can. You guys know um, uh, Andre Architect, Mark LePage, love, learn, share, you know, follow the, the, the same thing. So then, you know, it was a mix between an updates to, to what's happening inside a, a real, not that anyone else isn't real, but, you know, for a, a real architecture firm as we're growing, dealing with these challenges. Um, and then we added a Monday morning segment, too. So where we're interviewing different people. I just interviewed a passive house person, UFC fighter. Lance had on uh, John McAfee. John McAfee. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, he was radical. Totally. You know, and the other reason why, too, Alex, uh, the reason why we started the podcast too was because um, we wanted to just show people that they could start from nothing. Like Alex and I got laid off in the great recession, like many architects did construction yeah. folks. And we just wanted to, exp to help people show people like the American dream is still alive and real. If you, if you, if you put your nose, if you, you know, if you grind hard and, and do the right things and keep your head up and, and, and work hard and, and obviously put yourself in the place of being there when opportunity is abound for you. So it's also a documentation of, you know, we talked about like episode one or zero about how we landed our first clients, um, how to do really basic stuff about fundamentally like start a timer, like make sure you time all of your time. So you keep track of, you know, then you can understand how to bill and what billable rates should be. And, and so we, we really unpeel some, some stories that maybe people wouldn't even like. We talked about first time we had to fire somebody, um, what, what that was like and then how we worked that. through that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, we actually had some, some good mentors um, during this whole process, but we did kind of have to start from scratch and that's also an opportunity. Um, but th the other reason was, you know, in that vein of love, learn, share is, well, some people might be in the middle of Iowa or something and they don't have that, that connection. They want to start something. And, uh, you know, maybe they don't get to ask questions. They could email and just ask questions, but at least if they're thinking about that, they can have the information that someone might, you know, we might be slightly ahead of them in that process so that they can apply those lessons that we learn sometimes the hard way, sometimes the stupid way, 
and maybe make it a little bit easier. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the cool things was that you kind of just laid it all out there and basically anybody else who was getting ready to lay it out there or wanted to, they kind of knew that they weren't alone and everybody's going to go through these struggles. Everybody's going to have these issues and you know, they're going to, Oh, is it just me? No. You know, mm -hmm. you guys showed that it's not just them. Yeah. And actually that's a perfect point. We were, I was asking, this was a, a long time ago before the podcast, we were doing a big project and I thought it was just me because we were running in problems mm -hmm. with the city and all this stuff. And this older architect, he goes, no, <clears throat> him and his staff were working on, a project in uh, Prospect, not Prospect, what's the old airport? Staples in Denver. And they're redoing it. So it's 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 a nice development. Established firms are working on new, it. New urbanist style New urbanist. Yeah. And he goes, oh, we're running into all those same issues. And it was just a revelation to me. You know, like me, little new guy, just trying to make my little yeah. path along. And like, no, no, dealing with the same thing. Been doing this for years. This, this is what happens. So just that one saying from him meant a lot to me you know yeah i i noticed something over the years following your guys and your your story your podcast is the word that keeps coming up is like you mentioned it a minute ago lance grinding away hustling creating opportunities and so obviously at some point you guys transitioned from and, and not 100 percent because i know you still do kind of typical architectural projects right but at some point you guys decided to jump in this new direction, create new opportunity, buy some land, do a development on it. And then you took everybody on that journey with you. And I think that it's just testament to who you two guys are. Number one, that you are out there trying to create these opportunities for yourselves, for your staff, for, and, and then putting it out there for other architects to go on that journey with you. And I think that it really inspires a lot of people. Have you gotten feedback along the way where you've gotten that kind of, you know, inspiration to other people that they're talking yeah, about? Yeah, I think the, the most immediate ones that we got is there's a couple people that reach out to me from NDSU, the school that I used to go to, and have asked me questions and, and then thanked me for that. And I can't speak for Lance, but I'm going to start to. I'm going to try to. He didn't bring me coffee. He so already made fun of Iowa. This is, by the way, it's the second time he made fun of Iowa on a podcast today. I don't know what well, he has against Iowa. I only did one, and then <laughs> I just used the same joke. Um, <laughs> Love Lance, you, Iowa. Yeah. Lance was reviewing a project with someone and going into <clears> details <throat> about, you know, projects and codes and all that stuff. And I'm looking around the firm. I'm like, everyone's basically here and everyone that's not here, I know where they're working and doing like, who is he talking to? Like, this is legitimate, you know, like, I don't want to say boss who employee, but you know, or, you know, just something anyone would do in a firm, go over, Hey, here's all the particulars and stuff like that. Um, and then also telling him, Hey, keep a timer so that you know, you know, how much you're actually spending so that you know that are these bids working? Are you making money? And I assume, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, that you're just helping someone out. Yeah, so this this gentleman reached out to me on LinkedIn uh, because of the podcast. So we get we get those kind of emails. Th that's actually the best part. Like, yes, yeah. uh, we had Dell as a sponsor at one point, or Cat, um, and we get to meet we get to meet and hang out with with Evan and Cormac and and uh, all the that's other. So cool. I know all the other architect podcasters out there, which is a really cool tight little community because we all know each other. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, we've had dinner, right? But uh, that's the best part is when we get that surprise. Facebook message or LinkedIn message or the email. And so that's one example. One example I've gotten recently too is uh, somebody was using, one of the services I like to use a lot is Thumbtack. So it's not a plug, it's just a reality. And some architects hate it, but I love it. And uh, there's a couple, we've got a couple emails from architects and other business owners and they're like, I took your advice and now I need to expand because my business has grown by like three or four fold. And I'm like, whoa, that's a, that's a, that's, I mean, that's where you get chills and you're like, wow, I'm, we're actually making a difference. And then the give for no other reason than giving makes makes all the all sense in the world. And so over the years, you guys have done a bunch of different types of projects, right? You did you did Atlas, you did the tiny house, you did the Amazon headquarters uh, pro proposal just to try to get some attention from them and, and try to get them to come to Denver. And like you've done so many different things, including the podcast 
how did any of that like play into where you're going or what you've decided to do recently with going into becoming a developer? So my old boss, Leapskin, I don't know. I don't know if he, I want to say he told this to me, but I feel like he did, but, uh, <laughs> God, he's, I, I would try to trap him in the elevator, you know, and he's, he's Daniel Leapskin, right? So I like, Oh, he's going in the elevator. Me too. I'm, you know, with it, going for a coffee too. No big deal. Right. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, and he could have said this on a podcast, and I'm just misremembering it, right? But at some point I, I got from him, he said, always do a fun project a year. Do one fun project a year. And Lance was talking on, a, on another podcast, and he goes, do one project where you have control yeah. a year. Because sometimes building isn't yeah. that fun. Right. <laughs> sometimes it is, but sometimes it's... Same thing with designing, right? I mean, you can be do... Yeah. You've heard the horror stories about that intern at the IMPA's office, but like he was just the bathroom guy, right? Yeah. Or girl or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I think like we're, we're creative people. We're such creative people. Like I feel like our soul, part of our souls will die if we don't do one creative endeavor per year minimum that we just have full control over. It's a risk. It's uh, we met with this banker once. Remember, remember that conversation? Where he said he Which was banker. Well, <laughs> one, bank. one banker that we've worked with before, and he, he said he told us a story about um, the founder of Oscar Booze. If you guys know the Oscar Booze uh, uh-huh. Brewery, big brewery out here, all kinds of restaurants, and he's like, "Oh yeah, one we we would at the bank even we would have seed money for one crazy project a year." And he told us a story, and it, where he's like, "Guess who it is?" And I go. I bet it's Dale from Oscar blues. And he goes, it was. And then if, so if he wouldn't have threw that money at him with his crazy brewery idea, this is like when Sam Adams wasn't even a thing. Wow. And, uh, and now they're this, you know, well, and, and what is weird. And I, I know a lot of people won't know who Oscar's blues were, but they were the first ones to do the small batch brewery in a can. Yeah. Everyone else was doing it in bottles. And then that allowed them to expand faster and do all this stuff. Um, so Evan, like I, I, probably even before we knew each other, I probably knew of you, right? And you had your website and you're always doing your projects too, you know, your own individual projects. And what we found is when either fun or we have full control, you know, we have great clients, medium clients. I wouldn't say we have any terrible clients right now. No. But just to give an analogy, which probably everyone that's listening to this has had some sort of conversation almost like this is, I had a client who was asking me how long, the design processes. It was longer than he expected. And then I told him about, you know, what, what's actually, actually happening, what I deliver to them, their input, how long that takes. And then finally he goes, well, I'm not an architect. Uh, wouldn't you have better ideas than me? <laughs> and we were really vibing back and forth. And I go, honestly, yes, I will. I will have solutions <laughs> And I go, but the thing is that some people have lived in their house. They want this this way. They want that way. Like, oh, no, that's that's not me, right? And and when he said that, it, it kind of related to when you're doing that project that you have control or that fun project yourself is that you get to have your vision be authentically executed. And then that will vibe with a lot of people. Gosh, and it's really given like uh, staff a whole nother sense of ownership because I've seen uh, – like staff that's, you know, maybe within a year or less at our firm come in and have their hearts broken. And I, I guarantee everybody else had that in their career once before, at least, at least a couple of times where you're a young intern or a young architect, budding architect, maybe not even licensed. And you're just in love with this one house that you did or this one commercial project. And you're like, oh my God, it's perfect. And then the budget comes in and then it's just destroyed <laughs> or it never gets built or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but when we do our own projects like Atlas, the other two tiny houses, now Mark II that we're sitting in the development, um, stuff like that, we make sure everybody gets to touch a little piece of it uh, so that they really feel like they own it. They own part of it and they get that fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah. And then it goes back. This is a very long winded response to your, <laughs> <laughs> to your question. No worries. But, but the, the response is, not every one of those ideas that we do align to, oh, this is the path. This is the perfect path mm. to take. No. But it aligns with the theory of, oh, 
do we have time? Can we do one cool project this year? Mm -hmm. What is that going right. to be? That's the through line. I think the, yeah. So a direct answer <laughs> to finally get to one would be when we did Amazon. So it was Alex's idea. He did most of the graphics and kind of the programming and everything. And then I was the media person. So I spent a day, I think a day and a half on social media, boosting posts, doing all kinds of stuff like that, getting Denver 7's attention, Fox 31. And then we got interviews and then, and then from there it just went exploded. Um, we obviously didn't get Amazon, but we did get a call the next week oh, yeah. for a townhome project. And she literally, the gal literally cited, now she's one of our best clients and our friend actually. And she said, well, I picked you guys because you guys are, you're young and innovative and I could tell that from Amazon and that's who I wanted. And yeah. I go, oh, nice. But her first question was, um, you know, she called us up and said, hey, I saw you, uh, you know, on the TV. Do you happen to do townhomes? And that's, you know, what we do. That's the, literally. And so I figured, like, yeah, that's actually what we're really good at. <laughs> Not Amazon. <laughs> we would have had to hire one of you guys or something. I don't know for consultants for that. Yeah, for sure. Well, what, what's really interesting to me is you guys put these ideas out there, but then you really put them out there. I mean, I think that right. a lot of people will enter a competition or they'll do some project like you're talking about, but then they won't exploit it in the media sense, right? And I think that is something that I notice you guys do over and over and over again. Even if it is just for a day or two days afterward, you actually do as many things as you can to get it out there. Yeah. Alex really is the spearhead, was the original spearhead for that. And it came down to Flood House. Um, yeah. So Fargo, North Dakota. So right out of college, right when we started F9, you don't, we didn't have a lot of work. So there was more time actually for those kind of projects. So Alex took one of his theses, one of his, one of, one, a piece of architecture from his thesis. And it was a house up on stilts. And flood season happens every year in Fargo, North Dakota, that Red River floods. And put together this awesome design and then sent it to the paper and they ran a full page thing over it. And we're like, Oh, maybe there's a system here. Mm -hmm. So, and then there is, I mean, there is. And so like, you know, to hold up our most recent one that I'm excited about, that you've probably seen is when we got on the cover of builder magazine. Yeah. Um, so for that house, and it was the same thing. It was just me dedicating like two days of, of time. And thankfully we have a staff that can support my, me doing that. And reaching out to all these magazines and other places and putting together a press release. Like you really can be your own media at this point. It's pretty exciting. And it came from necessity too, because we've always had work. And then we hired our first intern and then that lasted the summer and then went back to school, but we were making up work for them to do. Yeah. And also it, it hit us is, Oh, if we ever do this again, mm. We are not going to make up work for them to do. I'm going to offload, and, and we made this decision. I'm going to offload my work to them, and then I'm going to make up work to, for me to do, which is to get work, right? Um, so nice. I was always the one that, hey, if there is eight hours, six hours, two days, it's not the intern just sitting there mm -hmm. doing, making them do something dumb or pointless. Right. I have to come up, and I have that drive of, oh, I realize we don't have any work maybe I should get some work somehow. You know? <laughs> and, and, and then I think that just dry. And then we just continued that with the fun stuff too, because we saw the, the return. You know, and that's interesting because that was a pitfall when, you know, my college roommate and I were um, on our own, you know, we were always so busy and we were kind of like so singularly mindedly focused on the projects that we had on hand that we weren't looking towards the projects that need to come in to sustain us longer and longer. And then 2008 happens mm. and we just weren't prepared to ride through it. And, and so, you know, these are the things that I, I, I love that you're telling the story because, you know, those were the things that we realized after the fact, Oh, uh, that's what we did wrong. Mm. We didn't yeah. plan ahead. Yeah. And, and also like we made that decision that I would do that and it wasn't, because maybe that was my strength, but actually Lance is also more productive too. So it was, oh, who's the more productive yeah. person? You, <laughs> and you do the work. Worked out well for me, um, but it actually worked out well for both of us. For the firm, yeah. I mean, totally, right. yeah. yeah. It was the only, I think it was one of the, it was, that's the key is trying to be able to multiply. I've seen this right. question all the time in the entree architect community. Like people are so nervous about their first hire if they're sole proprietors, and I don't blame them. 
you know, I feel like I have, I have this unfair advantage because I have Alex and Alex has me and we just, you know, there's somebody to lean on. There's a, something to bounce back from. But even, even in that case, if you're a sole proprietor, like how do you get to the point of where you can multiply? So then you can free yourself up and then do stuff like we're talking about to, right. to then further expand. And I know everybody has their limits. Like some people are like, oh, I don't want more than two or three employees. Fine. But that it's really hard to get off that first one and take that leap. So you guys talked a little bit about the power of social media because you said everybody can can be their own media producers, right? So obviously, I think Cormac, when you were talking about back in when you were running your firm, was that really a thing that you guys paid attention to? No, no, we didn't at all. I mean, we, we I don't think we even really knew, you know, what right. we, we clearly we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, we lasted for four <laughs> years, but, you know, <laughs> That was about it. Doing yeah, <laughs> yeah, to various levels of success. But so Lance and Alex, it seems like you guys try to leverage that. And I know that there's still questions out there, or maybe there's just a, a hold a hold up that a lot of budding firms come up against, which is, should I be spending time doing that? But what you're showing is that it's actually yeah. led to all these crazy opportunities. I think it really what it really comes down to is timing. So <clears throat> another good example of um, how we time stuff was, we, so in, in 2012, every, everybody knew this was coming in 2012, right? We've heard about the Mayan calendar forever. Oh, the world is going to end. And so uh, Alex and I were driving on vacation with our girlfriends, Alex and that now wife, um, down to like Arizona or something. The Grand, like the Grand Canyon. Canyon. Yeah. And, if, and as you guys know, you've been in the Southwest. Like it is apocalyptic as far as the landscape. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. so beautiful. Like Utah, oh, I, yeah. I travel all the time, but like yeah. Utah is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. The yeah. deserts are just, it's like, this is where the apocalypse, you know, if, if there was an aftermath and all that other stuff. So we're driving along or whatever, and we're just going off and bantering and we're like, well, what is the next one we should do? And this was like 2011. So leading right up to 2012, we were like, I bet people are, I bet Google searches are going to explode about doomsday houses. <laughs> and so we took the flood house and then we made three more. And then, so and then we bought the domain doomsdaydwellings.com and made these really cool houses that one was like, one is like a box and it could open up and it's, it's called this, the, the seed house. Cause the idea is it's, it's like, it's for fire. It's a, where you should, you should put it where it's going to be fire, like Western wildfires. And if you, if you, you know how that works as well, as soon as there's a fire, then all the seeds actually propagate afterwards. Like they, they actually need it to happen. Um, we made another house. It's called Genesis, and this one is for nuclear disasters. So it was like really spherical. Like Elon Musk would live in this house if I look at it now. It's very, very modern and like round and stuff. That one goes underground. Um, there was the flood house, and then there's house house for out in California for Evan if he ever wants to build it. It's uh, it's on like pads, so it can um, resist like, earthquakes. Yeah. So we made that whole website. We Alex spent all this time. We did all these awesome renderings. Um, we went out to the. We went out to and. We just did another press release, and then we landed a seven-page spread in Modern in Denver, which is our sort of our local dwell magazine. And like the advertising, if we went and bought those pages, this is when we had no. We, we still don't have any money. Well, we had even less money then, right? Than now. <laughs> and so, like, we, especially when you're in your first couple of years, like advertising is, it's just you should do it. But people are, you know, you got to pay yourself. You got to eat. The that each 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 of those pages is like twenty five hundred dollars is what it would have cost us, but we got all this free publicity from it, and then it's also cool because now you can like even that builder magazine I just showed you guys. I was in a sales meeting the other day at our mezzanine, and I got to pull that out and say, "Yeah, oh by the way, we made the we're the cover of Builders Mag." I mean, just all of a sudden it solidifies you. People are like, "Oh, I'm yeah. going with these guys." And and that the uh, modern in Denver. I don't even know if we solicited to them. I don't even know if we figured out the equation of soliciting to all the magazines right away. And, and maybe we did, but it's not like we knew that was going to get in there. It was, again, oh, this is a fun project that our authenticity is going to drive through because we're able to control it. And then and then what Lance is the adding on to this cake is, oh, the time. The timing. Can you do a fun project that is awesome, but can you time it with something that you know people are going to be talking about too? Yeah. The flood, doomsday, um, 
tiny houses were popping Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. I mean, we're a broken record now. Yeah. Like, there's the formula. There you go. And, and, some, and some advice that we've tried to give other folks too, where they're like, how do I do that? And then we say, well, here's an example, right? Denver is always, always, whenever the Winter Olympics come around, Colorado is on the list. I don't think they'll ever pull the trigger because, like, your your state is always a crazy debt after that. Or whatever. Right. But right. should you capitalize on that as an architect uh, and somebody with visual skills if it's going to come to your town and so you can give people a visualization? Like, newspapers are always look. You're going to make their job easier. Right. Think of it that way. Like, you are just spoon feeding these editors stuff. It then they can go home early and have a cabernet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like me. Yeah. So you guys work your butts off and then you decided you were going to add a whole other job description to what you do by basically building your own development. So how did that transition happen and why did it happen? So the how was we built Atlas tiny house and then a uh, fortune 500 company said, Hey, we want that, but please make it bigger, way cooler, put a hydraulic deck on top, make everything fold, make the railings fold. Um, and we want two of them. And we want two of them. Hmm. And, we, and we said, okay, but that's going to cost you X. And they said, sure. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, if they said okay to that, I guess, yeah. I'm, I guess I'm in again. Because so, it, it was, you know, and the reason I say that is because it is it, building those tiny houses is – it was hard. Building anything is hard in the yeah. sense that you're taking raw materials and making you're creating space out of nothing. You're a lot of your bang sticks into place. I mean, it is like this. It's still a very barbaric act. I don't care how precise we are with lasers. So there was a hesitation, obviously, um, because and that company also recognized, too. I think that was a unique thing that they recognized is that what well, Lance and Al are builders plus architects. Hmm. I feel like they're the only people that could get something like that done where it's foldability and precision and, and all of that. Yeah. So, um, and it's also hard to, if this, so, you know, we can talk about architect, the builder back then it was architect as builder. So it was like, you're running the firm and you're building. That's why it was also super stressful too, rather than sort of separating it and having a process. So mm. it's not, you're not literally splitting yourself in half trying yeah. to do two things at once, right? There's a, a better way to do it that we eventually kind of figured out. <laughs> um, just took us a while. Yep. Yeah. So then uh, after that, we built that. Then we used the profit from that to buy land to do this, to do the project that you see. This is our shop. There's tools down there. This is a little uh, interstitial mezzanine conference space and then the office upstairs. And the idea, the, the why behind that, besides, hey, it's another fun project that we have control with, um, but more responsibility, more reward, right? But architects and designers spend so much time and effort on a project, are so invested, know it so well, have a lot of the same risk, a mm -hmm. lot of the same risk, and a lot of the profit is not in your pocket. It's in the developer, it's in the builder. And it's, we've almost seen too, you know, especially when those roles are separated rather than stacked. It's like, oh, we're doing the same amount of work, but we're not getting the same amount of reward. So we had to test that out by building this. Yeah. And I, I would say it's not, there were, it's not just profit in the sense of money. Um, this actually wasn't a very profitable project for us in that sense. Uh, com like a lot of other our, our developer buddies said, I wouldn't have done that. Um, that's a very tight margin. We, we did it. But I think the other reward we got was we, we can say we've wore all three hats and that's, that knowledge is, is, is huge because now we can speak everybody's language. And then the other thing too is when we bring people in, new clients into the office, like we're just walking around like peacocks because it's, we're so proud of the space we made and we're so confident in our skills now from top to bottom. And it's really starting to translate down to everybody else in, in the firm when they can start saying like, they can tell clients now, oh yeah, that steel beam is going to cost a thousand and feel comfortable about it. 
or if we make this patio bigger, it's going to cost you this much more. Um, so it, it, there's been a huge reward of profitability in knowledge yeah. more than anything, I would say. And, and honestly, you know, if you don't learn and then adjust, you, you're being stupid. Um, <laughs> there's no other way to say that. So we, we thought like if we did have a plan, like, oh, we'll make this eight units plus our headquarters, nine units. And then the next one, oh, yeah. we'll make 16. It'll be bigger. Unit, or, you know, 18. Or, like that was literally the path looking to, to, to double up. And we saw how long the planning went. We saw, you know, how the construction went and all the risks that went with that. We go, wait, if this, just call it an aplex. You can do an aplex, the lead time from buying the land, all the risks, going through there, the process, and then building it, literally three years in the future, especially now, who knows what kind of Mad Max situation we're going to be in in three years. Like mm -hmm. three years planning is a lot different in 2019 than it was in 2016. Yep. It's a world apart. It is. So where we transition to is, okay, instead of doing that, and people can do that. People build multifamily all the time. Four houses are close to equal to profit, way lower risk, way easier to do than a multifamily unit development. Because not only can yeah. those four houses, we know the client over the architecture process. We get to trust each other. They know us, we know them. You know, it's close in, in proximity. But then that feedback loop is is tighter because it's not like you're buying the land, then doing all the drawings, and then waiting to build. It's it's no, they bought the land. Hey, you did all the plans. Hey, you bring up that conversation, and then you're immediately just extending mm -hmm. that project into the future. So that was a great lesson that we learned. So when you guys bought this land, how much were you sweating at that point? I mean, and that was just the very beginning. Not. Yep. I only we only started sweating once we had everything was approved. Okay. Except for, you except had to do for, it. Except for the fund. Except for the funding. Yeah. yeah. And the way it works with land loans, typically, uh, because most people buy them with cash. Well, we didn't have that kind of cash. We still don't have that kind of cash. And they, um, they, it's a balloon loan. So like, it's a three-year thing because they're planning for you to, you know, get through planning, build it. So planning one year, building one year. Selling one year, three years, and you're done. Uh, but it, so that that's when it really started to get I, nervous and nerve wracking was us running around for a couple months, yeah, trying to get it financed and through the door. Um, and then it finally did. Th then it started sweating again, right? Because then you're on the clock and interest is going all over the place and yeah. stuff like that. So, uh, but I tell you what, it's made us a lot more calm builder. Um, I, I feel like I'm able to really soothe and calm clients down, especially when they see costs come in. Now we have all there's extra there's other ideas that we have for like, hey, here's how you can save some money. And again, just having that knowledge about how much a garage door costs and being confident in saying what it what it costs, you know, or the difference between um, different kinds of windows and what those costs, or different railing types, um, all, all kinds of solutions. I, I just think it's made us. I hope it does anyway. Uh, more well-rounded architects and, and professionals in the building industry. Yeah. And, and not just us. I would say the, the people that work at our firm, mm. because maybe they aren't doing that call and talking about those numbers, but I know that they go on uh, construction admin visits, right? And they're, they're a little bit younger. And sometimes contractors can be intimidating yeah. because they're 45 years old. Sometimes they're grumpy. Sometimes they're not. They have a lot of knowledge, right? And they come back and have the conversation like, oh, they asked me about this. And then I go, oh, remember when we were building this? Because they were on the job site and that room right there and what we did. And they're like, oh, yeah, I remember exactly what that is. One, you know? one of our people in specifically, he has more, he has, he, I mean, he has had, he's just questioned constantly, just an insane amount of questions. But he has benefited, I, I mean, by magnitudes, I can't even measure, honestly. Uh, I don't even know how you would do it. But the question, there's just, there's not a lot of questions anymore because he knows he's confident in what he's drawing. You know, even if it's just like giving tolerances, the doors or something like that, he just gets how it's built now. So when you guys like, went through this whole process, how did you actually decide that you were going to share this out with everybody else and turn it into a course for others to learn from and, and learn from everything that you went through, which I'm sure is full of mostly success, but some failures and learn lessons as well. 
Yeah, let me preface one thing first. For this is more Al. I think Al should answer the this. But when we we were finishing this project, I was I was convinced, even though it was like one, of, it was literally one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, for sure. Because there was one point where I worked eighty days in a row, no joke. It was just it was in, it was a very intense process at the end. Um, but I was still convinced. I was like, okay, now we're gonna be now we're gonna be contractors. Like I know we're not gonna be developers after this, maybe for a while until somehow we we figured out how that could work better it just doesn't work well right now with how long it takes things to get approved financing all that kind of stuff but i know we should be that we should take something from this and grow from it and it should be as builders and alex was a little hesitant at first yeah. um well yeah yeah well i for some reason when we have our very stressful build projects i decide that my wife should have a baby at the same time yeah every time <laughs> time <laughs> every time it literally works out so it's like ending the project you're like well here's a baby <laughs> well sc- screw my decisions in life right yeah. um, I like how you decide that what was that <laughs> so but i mean that's almost a, it, it's almost a perfect reason why why we did this was that a couple of these were so difficult and i just finished the house you know a couple months ago and I, I told my wife, I go, because she's very, very understanding. But also, we'll point out from time to time, like, remember when I just had a baby mm-hmm. and, you know, you had to be on the job site or, you know, which is a legit criticism. And I go, honey, I hope you notice how on this last house, I tried not to have it impede on personal time as much. And she looked at me and she goes, yeah, there's it's pretty much seemed like normal Mm -hmm. me, you know, building a house. So construction can be extremely, extremely successful. And like we talked about, we basically had to find those mentors, you know, when we were essentially laid off and they're not always there, Mm -hmm. you know, for you. And they, they can't always be there for you. They're doing your, their own thing. So while yes, this course, you know, we do charge money for it. The, I don't think we charge as much money as the value that you're going to get out of it. And the reason I say that is because we have this, um, like people who want it before we launch, which is tomorrow, we have a discount and we can give it to anyone that's listening to, to, to this too. Um, but he bought it and he, I knew this client was going to build his own house, but he was on the verge of having a contractor or build own house. And it wasn't, wasn't going to be us for, for various reasons. And he, and he's like, Oh, I saw on social media, you have this course. And I go, yeah, you know, if you want it, I didn't even think he was going to buy it. Hmm. Um, I go, here's the discount. He, he bought it immediately. He goes, I just watched the first four videos and they're amazing. And it hit my head and I go, Oh, you're going to save at least $70,000. Like you're going to say, <laughs> yeah. I, I would not charge up for this course. I wanted, and, I wanted to charge more for the course just for the record. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, but, um, and, and, and I told him like, Hey, this is the course is for, you know, transition from architect to builder. So there'll be some things that aren't relevant. You're not converting clients or anything like that. Um, but I believe your question was, you know, like why? And I, I think that goes back literally to the beginning of, of, you know, we've experienced this benefit from other mentors. And I actually have some interviews with, with different builders in there too, as you know, just bonus interviews, you know, just kind of part of it. And a couple of them, and I was talking to other builders when I was developing this. I was getting, you know, different spreadsheets together so that we could do stuff. And don't let me forget, I want to talk about one of the cool things about it. Okay. Um, but a common theme, not all of them was, you know, hey, how do you get in it? Oh, my dad was in it. Oh, my uncle was in it. And I go, oh, something like we didn't have that. You know, other people don't have that. So how do you get over some of these hurdles if, if you just can't call up your dad or your uncle or something like that. So that's, that's a huge, huge reason, you know, why we did it. Yep. Yep. And, and to piggyback on top of that, I think it's what I would add is that I want architects to take more responsibility and really take back the profession so that they're master builders. Again, right. you can, you can still do all the cool, fancy design stuff. We do that all day long. I live in a really cool house. We, we, we operate in a really cool building. Um, but that, but but we also build them. And man, I just there's we hear it all the time as architects about these contractors 
well, they'll get the client first. And then we're kind of like eating peas at the end of the day and they're in more control. It's like, well, guys, we got to take on more responsibility then to get more, more financial reward, more, more professional reward, prestige reward, knowledge reward, all that stuff. So it, it, a lot of it is we want more architects to do what we're doing because I think it'll help the profession in a huge way. So, so let me ask you this before you remind uh, Al about the cool thing that he was supposed to <laughs> talk about. I don't um, know what you're but so this was something that Evan and I were talking about um, probably the last show, maybe even the show before. So as you know, the builders, you know, and the architect, I mean, how are you finding this affects the way that you document the project? Because you know mm -hmm. that you're going to be out on site and doing a lot of that work because, you know, I was, I was referencing to him that, you know, I've got all these old historic documents when architects were, you know, the master builder and, you know, they're like 15 sets of documents and things like that. Whereas I just set out a permit set that was 1,192 sheets. <laughs> and, you know, it's just like, you know, not all of these th things are going to be looked at. Not all of the things are going to be followed. And, you know, am I, am I just creating this big, massive stack of paper for nothing? Mm -hmm. And so I'm just kind of curious, like, how, how are you guys, um, you know, documenting the work that you're actually building? Let me give you two specific examples. If you steal mine. You are. <laughs> <laughs> He's not gonna bring you, you already know he's not going to bring you a coffee or a beer. <laughs> uh, number one, our electrician gave us some feedback that was really interesting. And I don't, think, I don't know how we would have got that feedback unless we were the GC on okay. one, one of the houses and the other projects that we've built. And he goes, would it be possible if you guys take the electrical plans and actually split them out so there's just an outlet plan? And a, and a switch and lighting plan. And I go, sure. Now it's a, now it's a company standard. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So that was a specific one. And then another specific one was how we dimension to beams, drop beams specifically. <laughs> so yeah, you're laughing. I know exactly. Right. Like mm -hmm. I'm sure you've gotten the calls like, well, I can't see. And rightly so. Like sometimes they're not the right dimensions. What we had done before is we'd put these, you know, the little tags in Revit or whatever, where it says like 101, you know, 101 and seven eighths inches and is bottom of the beam. 110 and seven eighths inches is the top of the beam. And I got so sick of after like three or four framing jobs of the of the subs asking that same question, like, well, what is the real dimension? I just needed the measurement from the top of foundation to the bottom of the beam. I'm like, yeah. okay. So then we had we brought the whole firm out one day. I pulled out the drawings and I and I literally already had them circled. And I go, guys. And gals, here's what we're doing from now on because I'm tired of answering the questions. This is how we're going to dimension drop beams from now on. And so there's another one. Yeah. So I was, it, it's a great question. Yeah. I was talking to a developer uh, probably like four or five years ago. And somehow I was bringing up, I don't know what question I asked him, but it was like, oh, why don't you do all of it? You know, architect as builder. Um, and he goes, well, I found when we, I tried that at a different company, but they'll just skimp on the drawings. Mm. they'll just skimp on the drawings and, and it, it, it's not the same. So like, right. that's why we wanted to, to separate it. So we make a distinction when we're talking to our clients too, that we're architect plus builder. Mm. Yeah. If it fits, if the right. relationship fits, because we've actually gotten projects from other clients that they had architect builders yeah. and then they broke up because they weren't holding up their end of the bargain. And then all of a sudden, we have to redraw everything because they won't give it because they're thinking of it as a whole. So they might be skimping on the design part and be like, we're going to make all our dough at the end part when we can <laughs> you know, easily add on 18%. And all of a sudden they're not executing the drawings well because that money isn't, you know, they didn't portion it. They basically have, you know, their, their pie at the end and they're robbing Peter to pay Paul. And then they're pissed when it breaks up. So we clearly separate like, Oh, we're architects first. We're doing that first. And then if we do the builder part two, the more the merrier, that's exciting. So like, I think that's key. But then the second thing is, is that exactly going what Lance was talking about and what you're getting at is that, okay, now that we are in the field, we want to be lean to be correct and be helpful, not to skip. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So right. that means, hey, we drew uh, eight sections for this house, or you know, cut them in Revit and, and fill them up. Right. How many times did those get looked at? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe the only one with the stair, yeah. and the rest of them were a waste of paper. Mm-hmm. We, you know, on, on very simple houses, this isn't a, you know, so don't take this as a general rule. Like, right. I've had contractors ask me, what's a reflected ceiling plan? What the hell do I need that for? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And sometimes they don't, right? I mean, now we're going out there building and I'm like, oh yeah, we really don't need reflected ceiling plans for like a simple house. And, and this isn't a standard, but like if you put the ceiling access on there and if you have your smoke detectors on your electrical plan and the framer knows how to build it. You think the drywall person is coming once it's framed and be like, what's your ceiling height? No, yep. it's there. You know, if you are doing, you know, um, so just all of those new nuances that we can apply not to skimp, but to be more efficient is, is going to be. Helpful. Right. And I think that was kind of where I was hoping you guys were going to go is it's not about necessarily the skipping. It's about the efficiency mm-hmm. and providing just the amount of information that's really needed to get what you want done, done rather than, you know, throwing all of this stuff in them just to kind of, I, I think I, I said it when, when Evan and I were talking to kind of like prove your worth or prove that, you know, Oh, look, I'm really working. You're like, you don't need to do all of that. Mm-hmm. You need to just be lean and show them exactly what it is. That's going to get your design built the way you want it to be built. Yeah. yeah. I think we're making a distinction about being a piece of the puzzle and understanding that, we're not trying to do it all, not every time at least, and right. actually being proactive and asking the contractor what they're going to need instead of assuming right. that we know what they're going to need. Because a lot of times we're just trying to get a permit set and we need certain requirements in our drawings to get that, but it isn't what they need to build it necessarily, especially in these right. 1192 set sheet <laughs> drawings, right? Yeah, so agreed. there's a lot of stuff in there that the contractor will never look at. And so then you have to start asking yourself, is this what they need to do what yeah. they need to do to be their yeah. piece of the puzzle? And, and if you're on the build site every day, you will probably be surprised how much you don't look at the plans. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a little, it's a um, joke, but then you go there and yeah. you're like, yeah, when it's framed, people stop looking at plans. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, wish, oh, yeah, yeah. I wish I could get our engineering students out to job sites more when, when everything was in person still. And when, when we're actually building the, project we're sitting in now, the one we developed, we did bring them out and it was, it was super helpful. But the point I always try to make to them, and I know that I know they won't get it until they go to experience a site is rolling your drawings up with the, with the drawings facing outward. Everybody knows this. And when you roll, unroll them, then they don't flop all over the place and they, they generally lay flat. And I try to explain to them that like, guys, these contractors don't give a crap about <laughs> the look of your beautiful drawings. It's more important about the functionality. Trust me. Right, right. Me. Yeah. So, yeah. I've been out on yeah, job I, sites where they'll tear one sheet out and give it to this guy and tear another sheet out and give oh, it to this yeah. guy. And it's all crumpled up and it's in the dirt. And <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's an instrument to get the thing built. It is not mm-hmm. anything anybody's ever going to frame and put on a wall. Yep, it's not our work. Well, yeah. Which, why is it we say that? Except we did. <laughs> <laughs> we, we took old drawings. And in our bathrooms, we use it as wallpaper. Nice. So in the bathroom, you can look at our sector plans. But you're right. Yes. I mean, seriously. Like, we have a set of drawings up that we just finished for a little addition we did up in a town north of us. Yeah. Nobody's framing those things. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. We just we, it, we have, like, this emotional attachment to this art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we think, you know, it's, it's our baby. It's our jewel. You know, it's, it's what we've done. You know, it's interesting as you, you guys say that about, like, the – I, I've actually noticed through my career the evolution of, you know, the old uh, site drafting table that they had all of the documents on, and then mm-hmm. it was all muddy and dirty and all of this other stuff. To the last few jobs that I've had, I didn't see sheet one because everything was on an iPad. Yeah, and they were, you know, they were running Plan Grid or something like that, and they were just working through it. And so most of the time i mean you're going to have your some old school guys that are going to be running around with their paper but for the most part they're you know on their ipad and and i would say if you have that bug to make it look pretty which some people do and they'll never get that out of there i would do it for the sake of clarity meaning exactly, like, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah, so like, how can you here's an exercise you're doing your dimension strength right 
what is the best location for that where you can touch almost everything so you don't have to break it into four or five different weird dimension strings and it looks all ugly that's that's the art to me oh yeah i still get off on like when i we get a, there's a new we have a new employee or something and they come in they're like you know they make the well i just had to make it i had to make this three sixteenths of an inch equals a foot and i'm like ooh, that's a big no-no you know we never do that and they go, well, I just couldn't fit it on the sheet. And then I make them fit everything on one sheet just as like tight as possible. And they're like, oh my God, I can't believe I could even. I was like, yeah, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you, I am still, even to this day, I remember when I was doing working on my own and doing my own projects. And even now, I'm super anal about the way that the gra- it all graphically lays out only because of that exact thing. It's clarity. You know, mm-hmm. because if you start like layering and throwing so much stuff in there, it's going to be far more confusing. And the the broken record that I always say to Evan, which probably he rolls his eyes every time. So cue your eye roll here is like if 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 we as architects have a question about what the hell the information that we have on the drawings are going to be, it's sure in the hell going to cost you a hell of a lot more out in the field to fix rather than you fixing it, you know, on paper. So get it clean, get it clear make yourself understand what the hell the information is that you're trying to say so that you can avoid half the RFIs that you would normally get. Like, I don't understand what it is that you're saying on the sheet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and no, it's funny. Most of the RFIs, at least back in the day, our plans must have got been better. Our, you know, they'd say there's a bust or whatever and call. Oh yeah. The bust. Yep. And they would be angry, but they were honestly just searching for the information. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just- yeah. 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 Half of my RFI answers used to be is, um, I can't, you know, uh, I need this detail. Oh, well, you know, look on this sheet. But it wasn't, you know, I, I started to slowly learn. I was like, wait, there was this logical order that I kind of like broke. And it should, you know, the detail that they were looking for here should have been right here rather than five, six pages out oh, down the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. That's a great point. We've actually even went so far as uh, – our framers and our foundation folks, same crew. And I, I finally sat down with them one day and I go, Gio, I'm going to teach you how to read drawings. And I, and nobody had, nobody had, they yeah. just, we just like, that is a, one of the mind blowing things to me. It's like, Oh my God, we just assume they know how we're coding things right. with right. our little book that we're making with all of our little symbols and stuff. And right. the questions from him have almost went to zero. Wow. Because now yeah. he knows how to navigate through the drawings correctly. I had to use yeah. a little bit of Spanish and everything, but it worked perfectly. It's great. Half the so. time they think they're looking at some Ikea directions. Yeah. <laughs> so I recently took the contractor's test, and I was you know, told, like, oh, some questions might be how to read drawings. I didn't get a single. I maybe got one out of 80 on that. I was like, oh, please give me 20% of the questions on how to read drawings. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm wondering out. if your guys' drawings changed at all because of what you've learned by building. The most re- – yeah. Well, yes. I gave those couple examples. The other one that I gave recently – and this is actually going in the opposite direction of doing things efficiently. Mm-hmm. So, because, so there's a, a tenant finish that we're going to be doing. It's a rather substantial one. It'll be one of our first ones that we've done. 4,000 square feet, pretty big um, in, in the town we operate in. And we're going to do this. Our crew that we have now built within our construction arm is going to do the steel framing. And so with my GC hat on, I needed to tackle two things. Number one, I need an accurate material takeoff because they're, the estimators are never right. And I know that I can be right because of the past builds that we've done, like down to the stick or down to the stud. So what I started so what I had our team do, and then they did it on another tenant finish um, where we, we were working to build it is, I said, I want you to model all of the steel studs, the tracks, everything. But this was after we were done and through permit. So this was us eating into a little bit of the profit, the GC profit. But the idea was we're going to make that up on the back end because our framing crew is going to look at that 3D drawing now. And they're going to know exactly how this thing goes together. And then it, and then it also saved me time because – I, I could get an instant material takeoff as soon as they were done modeling. So that's, that's one big one that we've done for interior finished jobs. We will model all of the studs if we're the GC. If we're the architect only, 
you know, it's a different story. Have you guys gone beyond the drawings? Like you just said, you include like, I assume these are like axons or something. Are they on a yeah. sheet or is it is it an interactive model that you're providing to them? Both, both. So exactly, it's an axonometric, um, a couple of them, right? Uh -huh. um, and they're usually on maybe one or two sheets. And then, I mean, it just makes everything clear. And we were already kind of doing that. We were already doing that anyway for houses that we were that we were doing the structural engineering for with our with our engineer. We were already modeling it like it was going to get built, like Alex talked about at the very beginning. And our framers loved it. Like we're, the the minute they saw it for the first time, not our framers, but the GCs who were building it before we were. Brian Tinker would call us back. Call us like I distinctly remember, it, and he goes, "Please do these drawings from now on because." It just minimized our questions. They're awesome. Yeah. The lumber yard loved it. Everybody loved it. Um, and then with the model, yes. So one of our construction foremen is pretty tech savvy, and uh, we've given him a laptop, and that's the idea. Is we, hey, open up. Here's how to navigate through Revit. Open it up. And and that question reminds me of something we did before we became contractors, but the, the through line actually led me to uh, led us to what we developed for this course that I said, remind me of that. I'm reminding myself of. So <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally, oh, yeah. he's not even drinking. Events. So um, one of the things we did when we could start a firm was we realized that it was only Lance and I, so we're the only ones making decisions so we can rethink things. So why don't we do things the way we think they should be done? One of the things we did with Revit is, Oh, we're going to, we're going to start fresh and model everything like it gets built, you know, so uh, frame, uh, finished floors are different from framing floors. Finished facades are different from framing facades because that models as it gets built. The more we can do anything, every, any little improvement to make our models and our documents like that, the better, you know, the better we're going to do. So then uh, it took us a couple of years. Then we thought, if you look at foundation plans, especially if you do multifamily or something like that, and there's going to be slope, all of a sudden you have 10 units going at different levels and some of them go back and forth. And you look at this foundation plan. In a it, 2D and it's just nothing. It's a mess of lines. Yeah. It's a right. mess of lines. It doesn't matter if you print them off on color and have like different hatch patterns. We did we did try that. Oh, yeah. And it was a disaster. <laughs> because you have, Again, it's like, oh, we assume, we assume these folks can read our drawings. Like we assume that they are, they're in our heads and they're not. And we even had a builder build all the foundations wrong. They were all, you know, because you have to match civil or fire rules. Everyone right. here knows what height, height about. rules, major height rules, right? You know, that you have to get built. So they are all, you know, like, Oh, this one's one foot down. This one's one foot, two and seven eighths. This one is four inches down. It's like, ah, couldn't do that. This is what he told me. <laughs> couldn't do that. I made them all 14 inches. All oh, sorts of built it, built it. The project got red flagged, it got halted. And here was one of the benefits of it because that was, you know, I was younger, but knowing more what I did, we modeled it, you know, in Revit. And I go, oh, I'm, and we modeled the structure, we modeled everything. I go, oh, I know it can be built that way because I modeled virtually it. Tested, way, right? Virtually tested it. So then eventually it, it took us a while and then we go, well, we're already making this in 3D and I think we had to do it for that client. Why don't we set up an automatic view that has a filter that takes off everything but the concrete structural foundation walls and have that at you know an, an angle and just tag the elevations. And if there are elevation tags, you can just like draw a line on there and that same line will be on the floor plan. They immediately see that. They immediately see like, oh, it looks like every 14 feet, it looks like you're changing heights. Let me look at this detail plans. Yep, right there. If I look at, you know, just a, a world of difference, a world hmm. of difference. And where I'm going with when we were building this, finally getting to my point, building this course, you know, we actually took our time and, and filmed things over a while and was putting together things. And I was talking to other builders and I was getting, this was maybe one of the major breakthroughs was I was getting a bunch of bid spreadsheets to compare to make sure that, you know, not only is this course, you know, us talking, there's also resources, um, you know, templates, things like that, that you can actually use and apply. And it hit me, okay, if everything we do on the architecture side is model like it gets to be built, why can't we apply that to the builder side? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's codes for build bids. 
GCs have different ways. Banks even have their own different ways the, of the, doing it. The CSI, right? yep. yeah, Construction Specifiers Institute, that whole thing. Banks have their own different ways. And I go, <clears throat> no, 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 let's break the bid up into the construction sequence. Mm-hmm. Here's your foundation undergrounds. Here's all your steps. Here's your framing and, and roof. Here's, here's all so your it, steps. So it's sequential. It's sequential. It, right. does two, it does two things, I think. So it demystifies the process. Because, like, honestly, even one of the one of the things that kind of blew my mind when we when we really first started building like traditional buildings with spread footers and all that was, well, how does the water get in? Like, do you guys just? And I had to ask the cells multiple times, and they're like, yeah, you just we just dig a trench, bro, and then you come up, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know it's, it's all mystical. So, uh, so it it really did demystifies that process of like, here's your sequence, and then it, then the other thing it does is when you go to put in your for your construction draws. You're going from a top-down scenario instead of like scrolling up and down and all over the place, and it's it's basically capitalizing on we've been implementing the two-second lean by Paul Akers over at uh, at the firm over the past couple of weeks, and making those kind of tweaks and like just getting it into the into the culture of the firm and what we do of like at any point if we find stuff like that where we're like oh I'm tired of. I don't know, dimensioning this certain way, or I'm tired of like having to tweak this schedule, go into the template, take some, take two minutes. You'll make up for that two seconds later, because we'll multiply that, you know, over the next 10 years and stuff. Yeah. And then also, I also noticed when, when I got the bids and this was the one that kind of told me it was going to work on the right, right track. I had electrical and, and plumbing and they would bill me out at rough electrical, mm-hmm. rough plumbing, rough mechanical. Yeah. And, so instead of just having one one line, I broke the spreadsheet into that. So when you get that bid, you can put in the rough number and the final number too. And then over on the side, you can, you know, like the plumber is maybe in three different, maybe he comes in the beginning when you're doing your undergrounds, excavation, yeah. undergrounds, maybe he comes for rough and maybe for finals. Well, just sort by plumbing, you know, like that's so much easier that, you know, by having it in that order, that, that's a that's a low cost for you to do is to sort by plumbing than to do it the other. And way. it's a cross check on your subs. If you're a new if you're a new GC and you've never you've never looked at a plumber's bid, a lot of these guys will just throw one number at the whole thing, and it's not really broken into the categories that Alex just explained. So it's a cross check for you because you're going to take their bid and you're going to go, hey Sam or Bill or whatever you need to help me break this out because in my spreadsheet, this is how it's going to go. And so then you are, it's a safety valve for you to find as you're a newbie, anything that might, that you might not know about like a nuance and you won't get surprised. Then you don't have to, then you don't have to eat out of the contingency fund of a, of a construction project. Here, because here's an example. <clears throat> what if they give you a bid for plumbing? That's $30,000 making up a number. And <clears throat> you go, okay, you put that in a regular spreadsheet, $30,000. You put it in our spreadsheet and it has, you know, the breakdown of rough, all that. And then it has plumbing fixtures and you go, Oh, did you guys include plumbing fixtures? Like, are you bringing the toilets and, and, and that? And they go, no, we don't do that. You know, you, you buy it. Well, in our scenario, you caught it. Yep. <laughs> in the other scenario, you get three quarters through the project and you go, we don't have this in the line item here. Our foundation, has to yeah, our foundation folks are notorious for that. Like, here's what the foundation cost is. And I go, is excavation included? Oh no, that's, that's separate. Well, you got to tell me. <laughs> <My grand. laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, wow. yeah. Well, I feel like we've got a good intro to the show now, right? So nice. let's jump into the meat of this here. <laughs> <laughs> tell us what this course is and what you guys go through during this thing and what people can expect to get out of it. Because this yeah. is, I, I love what you guys have done. I love how you've, really turned this back to this kind of idea of the master builder and you've been mm-hmm. through it yourselves. You're not just blowing right. smoke. So what is this course and what is it about? So it's called architect to builder. Uh, you can go to architects guide to architects, plural guide, and then just to.com and it'll get you there. And essentially it is us taking what we learned from building tiny houses, building crazy monstrosity tiny houses, building, uh, you know, an aplex, building houses, building a barn dominium, building additions, and taking you through the steps that not only we found were more beneficial to us to transition your clients into construction 
projects, right? Which basically is a safety net for your firm. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, really- oh yeah, especially when COVID hit, that was we didn't have to lay anybody off. In fact, we expanded because we we made that move. Yep. Mm-hmm. So because once you're funded, they're not taking away funding. You know, some people will do architecture plans where they're paying cash for. It. And then something hits and it's done. Once you're funded, you're secure for the next year for that project yep. or however long. Yes. So how we found the best way to transition to that, um, and you know, even little tips and tricks about like we tell you why when you do get your bid, you've already had these conversations. Send that on that in an email rather than a person. Here's why, you know, things like that. Then stuff that we had to learn. Uh, and you know, one of my that was a to just to drill in on that just a little bit here was. I was first going through the construction budget in real time and it was a disaster. And then I called one of our, our GCs who we, who's built most, uh, most of our really cool homes. And I said, how do you do it? And he goes, Oh, I send them an email on a Friday. Then they get pissed over the weekend and then they have a few drinks and then they calm down. And then we talk Monday and then we massage it and we, we do business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah. So, you know, multiple things like that. Then how to actually set up those projects, right? How to bid them out, how to, uh, what you're going to go through to, to get that project to start. Then also what you need to do to become a contractor, mm-hmm. what licenses you need to do, the different kinds. what tests you need to do, tests on tipping, uh, you know, t- tests, uh, tips on the test for doing all that. Um, and then take you through, okay, construction. Here's the general sequence, right? Here's the draw process. Here's e- even stuff as simple as if you never uh, have ordered inspections, you know, like how does that work? Well, here's how, here's how it works. Here's the general list of them. I'll take you through a real example where I blank out, out the names just so you like, I didn't, I didn't know that, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And, and all of these things that you don't know are literally, I know this piece I went through it, just adding anxiety adding anxiety instead of having clarity, right? There's a major difference if you're operating through clarity or anxiety. It, like, we can just tell you from experience. It's just a, a world of, of, of difference. Yeah. Um, and then giving you the resources that we put together, like I said, to, to, to mimic reality so that you can have more clarity through your process. Um, so it's us filming it. One of our foremen used to be a professional photographer and he has all the equipment. So it was filmed really nicely. The only ones that weren't were the ones where, let's say I'm going over uh, the details of something that's shown on the screen. Well, I didn't call him in to just film my face so it could be a little square, you know, and all that. Uh, So all that and all those resources kind of put together in one place so that you have the, the confidence to go from, to transition your clients from architect to builder and not do the same mistakes where you're overlapping, you're overextending yourself, you're operating out of anxiety, you don't know what to do, um, trying to set you up for success, you know? Um, and it was it was funny because I was trying to close a client uh, and I was walking around, for some reason I was walking around where every else one was and I was able to say, and I just pulled this line out of nowhere. And I think Lance gave me a high five even before I was Oh, I was done. so stoked. And, it, and I'm going to butcher it now, but, but he, was, he was saying, hey, he's new to this process. You know, he wants an architect that can help him. It's like, oh, well, we can take you from the first stroke of the pencil to the last pounding of the nail, you know, because we've done all that. And, you, you know, I, I should have ran around just high five everyone because you could just tell <laughs> the guys like, oh, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And it's backed up by, by, by what we've done, right? So um, not only do we think that, being a, a builder is just going to help you financially be very, very successful. And taking this course is, is going to help you not only in that way, but help you from losing money mm-hmm. too. Helping you from making, so like not only losing money, but profiting from it, but then helping your architecture firm, you know, your, your, your solid core base. I, I would love it if you guys make another course about how you've basically figured out a way to productize your knowledge mm. so that you can make money while you're sleeping, right? Because you guys have also transitioned by putting out courses like this and by putting out Revit Rocketship and things like that to 
you're not just selling your time for money, which is another theme that Cormac and I have been talking about on the show mm-hmm. a lot, which is architects just sell time for money. And so all of the incentives align to spending less time on projects, right? Which mean right. less fees. And you're trying to you're trying to balance profit and time and all this thing. And so by putting out a course like this, you guys have figured out another way to diversify your business and help people and make the profession better. It seems like, I mean, you, I just want to thank you guys. You guys are doing an awesome yeah. job. I think that's also a key point too, because if somehow we were going to literally take all this knowledge and format all that and try to give it to someone, like, I mean, you're talking $30,000 worth of time, right? Mm-hmm. But like you said, if you can prioritize it, multiple people can buy it. Like, oh, then it not even close. <laughs> and it, it does something like, Alex, what have you been saying to me lately? Uh, something like um, bring me coffee, bring me coffee <laughs> or beer. <laughs> <laughs> something about like uh, making money with no risk or very oh. little risk. Yeah, that, that was one of the giant. Just it's just a huge lesson to us about the being the putting the developer hat on. We're like, oh my god, talk about risk. I actually get why they would want to squeeze the civils, the architects. Like I understand it because like they need to make sure there's a, a big slice of pie at the end for them to go through years of anxiety and just i mean could be financial ruin every single time right right yeah. right right well what was the like it's that that was it, it was like okay no how, how, risk, how, no how can we how can we make money no 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 how can oh, we make money by minimizing risk yeah uh, because, uh exactly and so you're going to take risks when you become a, a builder right so this course will help you minimize risk. This course helps us minimize risk because there's less risk in, in a course, right? But then I think it also gives you the ammunition too to be able to talk to those contractors and everyone and, and tell them, you know, when they want to squeeze something for some reason, you know, hey, it's not worth it for whatever reason. I know that beam's going to cost you an extra thousand or, you know, this or that. But talking more on their level from experience it, it's just like anything like um if you have any shared common experience if you were in the army and someone else was in the army if you you know like oh you can just bond over that if, if you're talking to contractor like yeah i i built this too you know like it, they're darn no stuff and it's enough it's yeah. a, you know another thing too is it, it what i've noticed is some of our subs have actually brought us work now simply because we we have a different style of relationship with them same thing with the podcast like we have listeners every once in a while that come in and go like, yeah, I've listened to your, I, I know, I know I've listened to, you know, X, Y, and Z episodes and that's why I picked you guys. And I'm like, mm. what? Like I would not have expected that. So it's just another way of like putting good into the universe and, and the world. Yeah. And then it, it just always, it always comes back around. There was a Jonathan Siegel quote that I remember. You mentioned him early on in today's show as one of your kind of inspirations for, for doing this. And he said, Clients are not the answer to your problems. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> so have you guys felt like that is true? Or do you yeah. feel like this is <laughs> added to your bucket of problems as an architect? Um, in, wait, are you talking about the building portion or the core portion? Well, the developer portion, right? Because he basically said, I'm going to take this into my own hands. I'm going to be my own client. I'm not going to have to answer to somebody else's whims that change on a weekly or daily basis, right? So he's basically saying, I'm gonna control all of that as the architect developer. And you know what? I think that's on the pendulum of risk to reward. And I think that actually he's taken a lot of risk. And I don't know if we're set up that way because like we said, you buy the land, you wait two years to go through, then then you, you, you you build it. Then there's litigate, you know, like there's all these, all these things. And he's taking that massive risk, but if you follow him, he has massive rewards. Like I think he has Jaguars and, you know. Well, yeah, and I was trying to consolidate everything so he can build the skyscraper, which I think is like his retirement pinnacle project. And good for him. I mean, that's yep. like, that's a lifetime achievement. Yep. So there's, there's a scale there. And I think right now, hey, that's a good model. That's one we were following. Mm-hmm. We found another niche that fits the way we've set up our business for, for a long time. And meaning like we've, I don't, you know, he has an architecture firm, but early on he was designing and then building his own thing. So that is a streamlined that way. We've built up a streamline of clients that, you know, companies who have a regular architecture firm, 
So now we are minimizing risk because we're kind of vetting them to begin with, mm. right? There's there's less of a time gap. There's more of a feedback loop, and that works for our business structure. Um, you know, you can take the course and you could do it the other way, but you have to think about how are you fundamentally set up, you know, because you you could be fundamentally set up where you're doing one architecture project and one build project at a time. That's fine. That works with this. Right. That's more, you know, or or you do one development project over three, four years. Mm-hmm. And that's giving you a different level of reward. For us, it's like, oh, you can do, honestly, 50 architecture projects at a time and four building projects at a time. Well, that's how we built it, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's where I think we land in that mix of things. I wanted to be John Gall at one point, but I don't know if we'll be there. <laughs> All right, so what is the website again? Architects Guide 2. Architects Guide 2.com. Dot com. And right. you guys are F9 Productions. F9 Productions. Uh, Lance is a cat. I'm Alex Gore. Uh, <laughs> we uh, please listen to Inside the Firm podcast. Uh, you can you know find it on any podcast. We're also builders. F14 Productions. You just listed off the website if you want to go get that course. Anything else? If yeah, if anybody ever has any questions and they're listening to this, we are always around. Honestly, you could you can. A, we always give out Alex's email address, akg at f9productions.com. Mine is lmc at f9productions.com. You can find us. You can get a hold of us. We are always happy to answer questions and help people out in any way we can. And you guys are pretty active on Entree Architect Facebook group, on LinkedIn. And again, I just really appreciate everything that you guys do to share your experience and your knowledge with the larger community because that is how we move forward together. So mm-hmm. thank right. you guys. Thank you. We've appreciated this interview. It's, it's been real fun, guys. All right. Until next time. See you guys. Okay. Adios. Well, let's do a little wrap up here. What did you think about that interview with them? Inspired. I want to go by the course just to, you know, see what they're doing and, and just, you know, kind of get my hands around like, you know, what, because you know, this is, I, I, I love what they're doing because the thing that we are always talking about is, what are the other opportunities for architects? Mm-hmm. And they, you know, mm-hmm. architects seem to want to limit themselves to, oh, I'm going to design, you know, this thing and then pass it off to a builder and all this other stuff. And, and, and the thing that I, the thing that I loved what they were saying was is this opportunity to actually, do, you know, take control for themselves. Mm-hmm. And that is the one thing. You know, I, I had this conversation with somebody today, and they were talking about, you know, like. I guess because of, you know, COVID and everything else that you know, things are starting to lose a little bit of their luster. I mean, the shine is coming off of, of the profession and, and they're like, well, how do I get the shine back? And, you know, and it's just like, and I started talking to him about like, you know, the biophilia center that I did in Florida where you know, I was like fully immersed in the project. I was, I was part of not only just the designer as the project, but I was also immersed in their actual program and learning like what they do in doing things like, you know, building uh, gopher tortoise, uh, you know, pens and things like that, or, um, you know, learning about how they go out and, and even watching them, you know, go out and do like control burns on, on uh, like their uh, reforestation um, progress and, and things like that, you know, and like watching them, you know, like getting involved with what they do and stuff and, and not just being just an innocent bystander who's like, okay, I don't really understand what you do, but I'm going to design a building for you, mm-hmm. you know, and, and really having a greater, stronger connection to the client. And, and that's exactly what it sounds like they're doing is that they're going to have, they have more connection with the client. They have more, um, you know, they, they really truly understand and embrace what the client wants. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, and I love that. And, and, you know, and it's projects like that, that you don't lose the spark. You, you actually are like, it, it's, it's a new spark. It's a different spark. It doesn't always have to be the same thing. People get stuck in this funk and all this other stuff. And, and this is something that just, you know, it's like, what is the new adventure? The new adventure is I'm going to do a house. I'm going to do a deck. One I'm going to the- do an addition. One of the cool things about their development is that they're actually now practicing out of it. And imagine yeah. the amount of pride that they have oh, every time yeah. a client shows up to their office to say, yeah, we built this. Like we You're designed like, it, we built it, we developed it, we did everything. We know where every piece in this building is. And yeah. that's got to be really rewarding. And yeah, I, I agree with you. I want to take the course too. 
and I, it's not probably it's not because I'm going to be developing, but it's right. because I could learn so much by Absolutely. just following along with what they've been through. And I think that would help every project that I was going to work on. Yeah. And, and, and even like, you know, like, I won't say the advanced years of me in this in the profession, but, you know, I've been in the profession a while and I've dealt with a lot of contractors and stuff, you know, and but putting on the hat as a as both the architect and the contractor on like the same project gives you a completely different perspective of how to like interact with them. And they even said, you know, I mean, I think Lance was, you know, talking about how his perspective and how the dialogue between the contractors has completely changed. And now he's actually, you know, the, that relationship is stronger now, you know, and things like that, things like this course can actually help you do that. Well, we don't normally do interview shows. If ever, I think the hmm. last time we had a guest on the show was your buddy Steve Hoffman when we were talking yeah, about been... Citizen Architect, and right. I really felt like this was a great story to tell, and it was oh, hopefully going to be inspiring to our audience to put the shine back on what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, there it is go. a different way to look at things, and there is so much to learn. We get so yeah. kind of pigeonholed and in this rut of the day to day of the things that we do, and to kind of take a step back and get that bigger picture of the landscape. There's so much out there and these yep. guys are showing some other aspects of what's available. Yeah. Yeah. It's Very I'm fun. charged. Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks for hanging out tonight. It was fun. This was great. I loved it. 